My name is Thomas Munley, and I'm the President Judge of Lackawanna County Courts. I grew up in Jessup in a beautiful little town of 5,000 people. I had a great upbringing. Uh, my mom and dad uh, were devoted to each other, and they had five children, four boys and one girl, and uh, I was in the middle. And we had, we had no, we didn't have any money growing up, but we had a lot of love in our family, and that's what kept us going all of our lives. My mother was 100% Italian, my father's 100% Irish. Great upbringing, it was wonderful. I, and then after high school, I went to college. Uh, I was lucky enough to get into college, not having any money in our family. I went to West Virginia Institute of Technology for one year. I transferred to East Strasburg, got my degree from East Strasburg, which is not far from here. In 1968, I graduated, and then I was, you know, it's, it's so hard to get a teaching job today. I had the principal of the high school call me and ask me if I was interested in teaching. That's how easy it was to get a job in the 60s. And I was a school teacher for one year. In 19, the summer of 1969, I'm saying to myself, I don't know if I want to be a school teacher the rest of my life. I, I was saying, I always like politics. And I figured, you know, I'd love to have a career in politics someday. You know I love the ladies. Love to have my and I figured the best way to have a career in politics is maybe to go to law school. And I was thinking about law school, but I knew if I stopped teaching, the Vietnam War was raging then. It was raging in, in the late 60s, 68, 69, 70. And I actually went down to the draft board. I, I volunteered for the draft because I didn't want to be a school teacher the rest of my life. I wanted to be a lawyer and then maybe get into politics. And I always had visions of being something big in politics. So I was drafted in July of 1969. Now I'm saying to myself, well, uh, I'm going to have a nice, beautiful desk job because I'm, here I am, I have a college degree, I was a school teacher. So I go to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for nine weeks of basic training and then I got my orders for nine weeks of infantry training and I'm thinking, how could I end up in the infantry? I, I mean, I figured I'd have a nice desk job, maybe a counselor or something. Well, I went to Fort Jackson, I stayed at Fort Jackson for nine more weeks of infantry training and then after 18 weeks, they put your they put your orders. They actually let, the army, if I'm not mistaken, they let you pick where you'd like to go. And I remember putting down like you know an exotic foreign country where I like to serve my time because yeah, I had a two year two year duty. And the next thing I know, I got orders to go to Vietnam. I'm thinking Vietnam. And I'm thinking, oh my God, Vietnam as an infantry soldier. And I'm thinking, how did this happen? So in uh, November of 69, I, I got to leave for 30 days and bang off right to Vietnam. As the president determines to take all necessary steps, including the use of armed forces, to assist any member our protocol state of the Southeast Asia Collective Treaty requesting assistance in defense of freedom. I'll never forget it. I, I landed in, uh, 
I landed in a, it was the middle of the night. I, I think it was one o'clock in the morning or something, it was dark. And I landed at, um, I, I, the name of the Danang or someplace, I can't even remember. I was so scared. And I get out and I miss, I miss the next flight to take me to my next location. And I'm thinking, oh, which was True Life. And I missed that flight, but then I got on the flight, I ended up in True Life. And then the next thing I know, I think it was the next day, a helicopter decides that they're taking me out to meet my the group of guys that I'm going to serve with. Well, I'm saying to myself, oh boy, this is, you know, first I'm thinking to myself, I'm never going to make it out of here alive. I mean, I'm on the helicopter. I have my I have my M16 weapon in my hands. There's a couple machine gunners, a, a guy piloting, piloting the uh, helicopter and I'm thinking this is not good. I was, I was considered old for Vietnam too because I was 22 at the time. Most of the guys I served with were 19 or 20. So they're taking me out to an area and uh, the helicopter, I'll never forget it, the helicopter is a couple feet off the ground and there's nobody in the, it's a clearing and there's nobody in the area. At least I couldn't see anybody. There's a tree line right around where the helicopter landed. And they, somebody, the machine gun or somebody said, get out. And I said, what do you mean get out? The plane's a couple, this helicopter's a couple of feet off the ground. He's there, get out. And I'm thinking, oh my, I mean, what, what's this all about? And if, I, if I'm not mistaken, I, like he sort of nudged me out of the helicopter. And, and then as soon as I got on the ground, the helicopter takes off and I'm standing there by myself. In, the, in Vietnam, in the middle of nowhere. I had no idea where I was. And then after about, after the helicopter takes off, after about 15 or 20 seconds, I see guys coming out of the tree line, the surrounding area, with bandanas on their heads, bandoliers, uh, you know, the, with, the, with the bullets, just in, and they're wearing their underwear because it's so hot, it was so hot in Vietnam. And one of the guys, I'll never forget it, he was from Missouri, he, he motioned for me to come over. So I, he looked at me and he said, what's your name? And I told him, he said, where are you from? And I said, Scranton, Pennsylvania. He said, all right, from now on, your name is Scranton. That I swear, for I was in Vietnam 11 months and five days and that's what they called me. My first firefight, where you actually get involved in a firefight, was uh, uh, the end of December, New Year's Eve, 1969. We're pulling guard. There's seven or eight of us in a squad. We're all pulling guard. And uh, one of the guys was looking through an infrared light, and he sees some, some of the enemy heading towards us. And he said, don't do anything until I, till I shoot. And then when, when, when I shoot, everyone, everybody else is shooting. So he waited a couple of seconds, which seemed like an eternity. And all of a sudden he's go, he, what we call it opening up, he goes with bullets. Then I start shooting. After a few seconds, I'm still shooting. It was maybe two or three in the morning. I look around, nobody's there. I'm by myself and I started, I panicked. I have to be honest, I panicked. I'm thinking, I'm only in Vietnam two weeks, I'm gonna get killed now. So I decide, I, I, I made a decision, what am I supposed to do? So I got up and I turned, I started to run away. I started to run in the opposite direction. And uh, I remember, believe it or not, I, I, in the middle of the night, I, I hit a tree or something. I don't remember what it was, but while I was running, I hit a tree and it knocked me down and I, I was knocked out for a couple of seconds. Then I, I woke up and I just sat there until, until daylight and I, I walked a couple hundred yards and I ran into re the rest of my guys. And I said, what happened? I said, y you know, he said, look at Scranton, this isn't John Wayne country. He said, he said you wanna, if you see somebody coming and you shoot, you get out of there fast. And that's, and I learned and that day in December of 69, that's, that's how this war was fought.
after I learned my lesson on New Year's Eve, that it's a question of survival, I decided that I'm going to spend my year in Vietnam trying to keep my American soldiers who served with me alive. And we covered each other for a whole year. And we, and we you know, here, here's the thing people don't understand about Vietnam versus World War II. World War II is a tough war. But World War II had front lines. You'd, you'd, you'd be in a battle and then you'd go to the rear. In Vietnam, there's no rear. There's no like front lines. And every day, you're, every day in Vietnam, while you're, out in the, while you're out in the infantry, you're facing snipers. You're facing the enemy shooting at you. You're facing artillery rounds. You're facing mortar rounds. You're facing uh, booby traps, which you, which every, all of us almost stepped on while we were there. I mean, that's the way it is. And, the, and you don't go to a, you, you, maybe once a month, we'd go to an area on top of a mountain to, uh, to like to, to get a little rest. You're sleeping out in the, outside every night, but, and there's, there's snakes, there's rats, there's everything else around. Uh, and then uh, I'm thinking to myself, wow, how, how could somebody put up with this? I put up with it because I was a little older. I was a little older than most guys, and I figured, hey, I'm going to get out of here alive. And I was lucky. I never even got wounded. Uh, people don't understand, uh, like when you're in Vietnam with somebody, it's not, hey, I'm your friend, let's go out to dinner and, have, and be we'll spend a couple hours together having dinner and a drink then we'll go home it's not like that it's 24 hours a day of intense pressure intense pressure from all the reasons why i told you you can get killed 24 hours a day seven days a week a lot of times you don't have food i remember offering a guy a month's pay if you give me one little piece i would we were we were so hungry they couldn't get food out to us i said i'll give you a month's pay if you give me a piece of that cake that you have, but he wouldn't do it because he said, I'm sorry, I'm too hungry. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, you, we, we, we got fed a lot, but when, it's not like being in the rear area where you have your three meals a day. It's just not like that. And you drink water, uh, you know, you drink water from a swamp uh, or a rice paddy, I should say. You just fill up your canteen, put iodine tablets in it and drink it. That's the way it is. And uh, like sometimes they'll send out fresh water on helicopters and, and they'll send out the mail, but it's not on a daily basis. But I remember it was monsoon season and I, and I, I, I went up under to, to sleep outside at night. You sleep outside every night in swamps and anything else. And I, I was under this tree and the lieutenant said to me, he said, move out from under that, get out of the, that tree area, he said, let so-and-so sleep there because he's ready to go home. So I moved out about 50 yards away. He gets under the tree. In an hour, he's dead. Because then a mortar round landed right on him. And I'm thinking, wow, that, that would have been me. And you know, it's funny because World War II, you had foxholes and stuff like that. We, we never really had that in Vietnam. You just lie down at night in an area uh, it is just, it was just horrific. And so tonight, to you, the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, I ask for your support. I pledged in my campaign for the presidency to end the war in a way that we could win the peace. I have initiated a plan of action which will enable me to keep that pledge. The more support I can have from the American people, the sooner that pledge can be redeemed. For the more divided we are at home, the less likely the enemy is to negotiate at Paris. Let us be united for peace. Let us also be united against defeat. Because let us understand, North Vietnam cannot defeat or humiliate the United States. Only Americans can do that. I didn't believe in the war to start with. I figured uh, I never believed in the Vietnam War. Uh, and 
The first time I felt I made a big mistake was when I got my orders. To, I didn't mind going in the army for two years as a, a draftee. I didn't mind that, but I but I never expected to be anywhere near Vietnam. I figured I'd serve my time in in France or Germany or something like that. I never figured I'd be an infantry guy in Vietnam. And once I got my orders for Vietnam, I knew in my own mind, I said, oh my God, what did I get myself into? That's what exactly what happened. Because guys were getting killed in Vietnam. I, I got there right after the Tet Offensive. A lot of American soldiers got killed. I remember some guys used to say, boy, I hope I, this is the, this is the truth. I remember a guy saying, well, one guy saying, "Well, I hope I get my foot blown off." That's called a million-dollar wound or something. You know, you don't get you don't get killed. You get your foot blown off and you, you come home. That's how bad it was. Like you, you, guys would think. Uh, um, I can even remember thinking about that myself and saying, "Well, at least if I got a million-dollar wound, I'd come home alive." But you know, it's it's it was just a funny war. And when you don't believe in it, it makes it worse. I sent a letter when I was in Vietnam. I sent a letter to the Scranton Times objecting, saying I didn't believe in the war. And the, the guy who passed away, Joe Flannery, printed it. It said, infantryman asks why. And uh, at that time, I, I said in, in the article that I wrote, only f uh, we lost 41,000 lives and why. By the time Vietnam was over, it was closer to 60,000. And then I uh, probably, I don't know the figure, but I'd say about 300,000 injured seriously. For what? So, I mean, it is, you don't know, for, you said, I mean, for what? So, uh, um, the, the, the defense mechanism we have in this United States can make a lot of money? I don't know why, but uh, I didn't believe in the war when I was serving, and I, I, and I still think, I, you know, it's so hard to say this because you don't want to say they died in vain, but I'm I'm just mad at the the, the the politicians who sent them there. In my opinion, just to better their own lives. And I used to think to myself, let's see, the first soldier was killed in ninth American soldier, what in '64, '65, the last one in '75. I wonder how many now figure how many United States congressmen you have 435 congressmen, and they change a lot figure how many of their children got killed in Vietnam from 64 to 75 or United States senators sons or daughters how many of them got killed in Vietnam I don't know the number but I probably would say it's zero you know why because it's so easy to send somebody else to die I, I often think about the, my friends who didn't make it, and they were friends of mine. And I visit the Vietnam Wall in Washington, and uh, it's unfortunate because they, I remember a, a guy showed me a picture. I remember his name, I don't want to mention it, but I remember his name, he showed me a picture of his two children. And I looked at his eyes, and he looked like he had a little, a little yellow jaundice in his eyes. He didn't look healthy. But he showed me the picture and he was telling me how much he loves his kids. He, he got up and somebody called me and, and I, I, I fell back. I fell back a few, a few yards and he stepped on a booby trap and he was killed in a matter of, you know, seconds. And, you know, I'll tell you a story because when, 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 you look, when people get killed like that, they don't, some of them don't die instantly, but uh, uh, I, I, I remember uh, this guy was, you, you, of all the people in the world you can call for, people call for their mother at the, your last seconds in life. Like if you, something like that happens, that's what happens to people. I remember I was in Vietnam one time and I, I swear I heard my mother calling me, but it was, of course, it was my imagination thinking that. <laughs>